In this video, I will be discussing about foundation of education during the medieval times. So this is only a video presentation and I hope you will stay at the end of the video. And let's all together learn what happened or what is foundation of education during this time. So. So, you know, foundations of education refers to a broadly conceived field of educational study that derives its character and methods from a number of academic disciplines, combinations of disciplines in areas of studies, including history, philosophy, sociology, anthropology, religion, political science, economics, psychology, cultural studies, gender studies, comparative and international education, also educational studies, and educational policy studies. So, so much for an introduction, so I would like to take this opportunity to thank Google for this very, very long introduct introduction message. But anyway, I'm your presenter today, and my name is J.R.B. Aspero, and I am in charge for this topic. Now, let's go with the topic outline on, on what I am going to discuss. So the first is we have the monasticism, and then we have the scholasticism, we have also chivalry, and then the guild system of education. Now let's go with the history on what happened during this time. Now the fall of Rome in 476 after death was considered as the end of ancient times and the start of medieval history. In this period, there are four educational systems or movements that emerge. So those are the educational systems that I just mentioned. So the number one it was monasticism, next was the scholasticism, then the chivalry, and the guild system of education. Now, each educational system it bears different characteristics and features that greatly influence our today's Philippine educational system. The, the, the medieval concept of education was centered on spiritual, also with uh, what you call intellectual, also political, and economic development. The medieval period of philosophy represents a renewed flowering of Western philosophical thought after the intellectual drought of the Dark Ages. So much of the period was marked by the influence of, guess what? Of course, we have the Christianity, and many of the philosophers of the period were greatly concerned with proving the existence of God and reconciling Christianity with classical philosophy. Now, what is really monasticism as the first educational system during those times? So, this is a special form of religious community life, wherein sometimes, or let's say, people separate themselves from ordinary ways of living. And this was based on Jesus' passage, be perfect, Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So that's what that was taken from Matthew 5. And also, this monasticism, it came from the Greek word monos, which means alone. And sometimes, it is also called monasticism because it literally means dwelling alone. Okay. Now, with... Let's go with the, the, the famous people during this time. So who are those people? So we have the first one, we have St. Patrick. So he founded the first monasticism in Ireland between after death, 432 and 461. So, and next is we have the St. Anthony. So he, is, he was the founder of Christian monasticism and also called the, the, the father of monasticism. Next is we have the monks and nuns. So this is the time, or this was the time, where monks and nuns were developed. Now, when do we say, or how do we differentiate monk and a nun, or monk from a nun? So men who adopt a monastic life are called monks, and while women are called nuns and live in convent. P. 
people working and living together in highly organized communities can seem very marginal and odd. We may not have anything particularly against monasticism, but it can seem just very unusual, something that might work for a very few individuals without being relevant to the lives of most people today. At its core, monasticism puts forward the bold thesis that people can actually lead the most fruitful, productive and happy lives when they abandon the idea of coupledom in a single family dwelling, get together into controlled, very organized groups of friends, have some clear rules and direct themselves towards a few big ambitions. So we have monks and nuns. Now, let's talk about the aims of monastic education. So we have the first one is spiritual. So for the spiritual, this is to save individual souls. So that's how they believe for their monastic education. Next is they had moral. So this is to attain, um, let's say, the ideals of um, poverty and obedience. And also they have spiritual knowledge wherein, you know, this is to attain the highest spiritual knowledge and to achieve mm, spiritual perfection. And also the virtue, which is the world renunciation. Then after that, we have the agencies of education. So what are those agencies that they use for their education? So in our time, we call it, you know, the, the school. We have different types of schools. So we have private, public, and we have a lot of schools in a specific area. But during this time, they have only a few agencies of education. So they are called monasteries. Monasteries became influential during the 1066 and 1300. On more than 300 monasteries, the monks educated the children, helped the poor, and cared for the sick. By 1500, some were closed down by Henry the, the uh, Henry the Seventh and sold them. So let me show you some examples or some example of the picture of a monastery. So we have the first one is we have the monastery of Saint Anthony in Egypt, and this was built over his tomb. So under this monastery was the tomb of. Saint Anthony. As you can see, it, it is it yeah it is surrounded by desert because this is in Egypt. So this monastery is standing in an oasis in the eastern desert of Egypt, in the southern part of Sous Governorate, hidden deep in the Red Sea mountains. It is located 334 kilometers or approximately 208 miles southeast of Cairo. Now we don't really have an idea where is this you know the place was exactly located because we haven't been there in Egypt I don't know some of you but uh, the monastery of Saint Anthony was established by the followers of Saint Anthony and they were considered or they were called the, the first Christian monk and then the monastery of Saint Anthony was one of the most prominent monasteries in Egypt and has strongly influenced the formation of several Coptic institutions and has promoted monasticism in general. Several patriarchs have come from monastery and several hundred pilgrims visit each day. The next monastery is what we call, or let me show you, the monastery of St. Catherine's or St. Catherine's Monastery. This was one of the oldest working Christian monasteries in the world. And this was located on the Sinai Peninsula at the mouth of a gorge at the foot of Mount Sinai. So we have the mouth of gorge and the foot of Sinai. So as you can see, it is also surrounded by desert because this is still located in Egypt. Now we don't know where these places are because these are all in Egypt. Let's just imagine through this picture, but the monastery is named after Catherine of Alexandria. This was built between 548 and 565. The monastery was one of the oldest working Christian monasteries in the world. The site contains the world's oldest continu 
continually operating library possessing many unique books as the Codex Sinaiticus until 1859 with recently new um, folios coming to light, including the Sinax Sinaiticus. Next for monasticism, we have the seven liberal arts was its curriculum. So what are they? So this seven liberal arts, this was divided into two groups. So the first group is what we call the trivium or the three roads. So we have the first one is the grammar. So it talks about languages and literature. Next is we have the dialectic or dialectic. It's logic or right reasoning. And then we have the rhetoric, which is law and composition. And then the other group, we have the, the, the quadrivium, or it refers to four roads that uh, as their meaning. And then we have the geometry. So geometry, geography, and natural history. Also, we have arithmetic, talks about numbers and study of the calendar. Then we have also the music. So it's a plain chant and harmony used in church. Then we have astronomy. So it talks about the heavenly bodies, chemistry, and physics. And we have also the types of education. So what type of education are they using? So we have moral and religious training. We have also literary education and manual training. Then for the methods of instruction, they also use Katikitikal method or let's say um, a religious type of method. And then we have dictation, memorization, language, discipline. We have also meditation and contemplation for the thoughtful reflection. So what are the greatest contributions to education of this monasticism? So we have preserving culture of Christians' monasteries. Up until now, we have this type of culture. And we have opposing voices, or vices rather, and corruption. And the taming warlike spirits. And also giving dignity of labor. So those are the greatest contributions to education of this type of system or educational system, which is the nasty ZZ. Now, let's go with the next type of educational system during medieval time, which is scholasticism. So scholasticism was a general designation for the particular methods and tendencies to rationalize the doctrines of Christian church. Now, what is scholasticism? So let me introduce you again to the most or one of the famous person during his time. We have Aristotle and he had used logic to try to prove the existence of God. He also or the revised beliefs and logical methods of discussion were termed scholasticism. So he has also the greatest contribution on this educational system which is scholasticism. And for the father of scholasticism, I want you to meet Saint Ansel. So St. Anselm of Canterbury, during 1033 to 1109, he was the outstanding Christian philosopher and theologian of the 11th century, and he was best known for the celebrated ontological argument entitled for the existence of God. <laughs> Then we have the major scholastics of the 12th century. Let me just um, introduce to you to these people during the 12th century. So we have um, St. Albertus Magnus, Alexander of Hales. We have also John Dunn Scooters, Robert Grossites D. And we have Roger Bacon. We have William of Oakham. We have also St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Bonaventure. 
Now, let's talk about the aims of education during scholasticism. So, it's more on intellectual discipline and faith by reason. And the agencies that they use during this scholasticism are we have the parish of school. So, this is an example of the picture during the scholasticism with the parish of school. We have also the monastic and cathedral. And we have also the palace school. Then we have the university. Now, the methods of instruction we have. Um, the first one is we have the argumentative method. So this one is starting a proposition, thesis, or questions, then followed by setting down objections to the propositions and pro proving one side and answering or disputing objections in order. Then we have the lecture, repetition, disputation, and examination methods. Then we have also the Aristotelian logic and the problem method. The greatest contributions to education during this time are organization of the university and also emphasis on the intellectual training. And that's it for scholasticism. Now we go with um, chivalry. What is chivalry? So chivalry comes from the old French word chivalry, meaning um, forced soldiery. The term came to mean the code of behavior and ethics that knights were expected to follow. And also, this is also the rise of the age of feudalism. So feudalism, the general term to describe the political and military system of Western Europe. So there's no central government and there's a little security. Also fulfilled the basic need for justice and protection. It also has a system of land tenure on allegiance and service to the nobleman or lord. So during the, the age of feudalism, um, this is a sample presentation on how they serve their lords, their knights, and their king. So the, the basic or the, the lowest rank is what they call the serfs. So they provide food and services to the knights or vassal, and then these knights or vassal they grant land to the serf, and also these knights and vassal they also provide protection and military service to the lords, and this lord they're the one who grants land to the knights and vassal, and these lords what they do is they provide money and knights to the king. So the highest, um, the highest among the, the, the four of them is the king. And the king grants land to the lords. So that's the age of feudalism. And next is we have the aims of chivalry education. So the, the, the first aim is what they call morality. Morality is what they want to inculcate in the minds of the young. As much as possible, they want it to start from a very young age for each children and then they have also um, responsibility for the responsibility this is to get the young nobles to assume their responsibilities how to manage their own estates and how to deal with the lower class of people next is the horsemanship horsemanship this is to train the young nobles in horseback warfare hunting and also um, tournaments next is the gallantry for the gallantry this is to train the young nobles how to deal gallantry with the ladies of the nobility and to protect the weak and also they have religiosity so for this one this is to train the young nobles to be devoted to the service of god and also the last one is the social graces. This is to train the young girls in the social graces and manner fit for the ladies. So that's for the aim of chivalry education. Now, um, the agencies of education, what are they using? 
for their education. So first is they have the home. So home, this is for the young boys and girls. And next is the court. So the court is only for the girl. And then the castle, these are only for the boys. And then the, the troubadours, mini singers and minstrel. So they are using the vernacular. They sang about the noble deeds of heroes, beautiful ladies, brilliant deeds of knights and lords. They spread news. They gave warnings about impending dangers, brought messages from allies and friends, and troubadours propagated learning through their songs. Now, what are they studying during this time or during this chivalry um, types of educational system? So they have religion, music, dancing, especially for the girls. And they also have horse riding for warfare hunting and tournaments also physical exercises then they also have reading writing literature in vernacular so they're using their own language and then they have also good manners right conduct social graces and proper etiquette and also household duties such as sewing weaving cooking and embroidery for girls okay at higher level, the curriculum consisted of the seven free arts. So those are, we have the jousting and patterning. We have also swimming, horsemanship, boxing, and writing and singing in verse. And they also have chess. Among this curriculum, we are not really familiar with jousting and falconing. But jousting, this is a generic term in the Middle Ages to refer to many kinds of martial games. So this is more on... Uh, like let's say contact sport and then for the falconing it's more on hunting in the middle ages so th this were enjoyed by the nobles of the time and also called as sport of kings next is the methods of instruction so they are using observation imitation and practice they also use apprenticeship and motivation. Then the greatest contributions to education, they have the use of vernacular as a tool of teaching, which in nowadays we are also using this. And then we ha they had the, the emphasis placed on the learning of social graces, rules of etiquette, or good manners, and right conduct. So that's it for the chivalry. Uh, types of educational system during the medieval times. Now let's go with the guild system of education. The guilds were associations of people who had common interests or who engaged in the same work. So these are the people who perform, for example, uh, charitable, religious, and social guilds. So more on a group of people. The guild system of education um, we have religious guilds, so paid money to a common fund, and then the alms. It's a relief that was given to members who needed help because of sickness or old age. And then the mass. Guilds arranged to be offered for members who died. The religious guilds were suppressed in England in the 1500s. These guilds are known as the merchant guilds and craft guilds. And what are the aims of education? So they have the business interest and preparation for commercial and industrial life, and also vocational preparations. And for the agencies of education, they're using the burger school. For the, the burger school, as the guild organizations gradually merge with those of the towns, the guild schools were generally absorbed in the um, what they call the institution known as the burger or they also call it um, town schools at first these burger schools were not very dissimilar to those established by the church it's still almost the same except that they were more conveniently located but later various types of vernacular schools arose to meet specific practical demands especially writing and reckoning also, they have the, the chantry schools. 
For the Chantry schools, this is another type of institution that came into prominence toward the close of the Middle Ages. And this was the Chantry school. So this school, it's a sort of of at first arose at where it arose out of bequest by wealthy persons to support foundations for priests who should chant like masses for the repose of their souls so since these religious duties did not absorb all the time of the priest they were able to do some teaching and before long the founders of chantries themselves came to direct that the priest carrying out their will should be required to teach and often too chantry priest was provided one to teach a grammar and the other is a song or a vernacular school from the first most of uh, these chantry schools this uh, there were free of all tuition charges so students are not paying anything the priest being requested to teach um, gratis as what they call without asking and also they have the guild school the guild had retained one or more priests to perform the necessary religious offices for their members before long they also utilized these functionaries to keep a school for the benefit of their own and sometimes other children in, in the town later endowments were furnished especially for a priest to teach school, or an amount sufficient for the purpose was paid out of the common funds of the guild. So these are the, the, the three agencies of education that they use during the, the guild system of education. Then for the methods of instruction, they are also using observations, imitation, and practice. They are also using dictation, memorization, and also the catechetic <laughs> catechetical methods or a religious type of method so I, I'd rather use religious type of method instead of pronouncing this catechetical method it's too hard for me and uh, next is also they have discipline so the greatest contribution to education they have vocational training or manpower development which we also using this nowadays and they have also apprenticeship and that's it for my report for the, the Foundation of Education during the medieval times. I hope you learned something and uh, thank you again.